So, hello, and welcome to another Woodworking Wisdom. Just checking a few things. So today we're going to have a, I hope it's not going to be a dull subject, but I, they're pretty sure, believe me. We're going to do a little bit of a, an in-depth session on the basic wood chisel. Not that exciting, really, is it? But kind of gets you thinking when you start looking at this. I have a bit of a history, I suppose, with doing woodwork since about the age of 12. I left school, went to college, bought my own tools, worked as a furniture maker for a guy until I was about the age of 26, 27. And all that time, always need a basic wood chisel. They are the fundamental part for anyone that's a home DIYer, your fine furniture maker, your guy doing timber frame buildings. They all have a wood chisel. There are different types. And people are going, really? And it can be confusing if you're not familiar with the names and what they are, how you're going to use them, what their function is. Why do they have different names and things? They have different functions that they're going to be useful. It's as simple as that in ways. So we're going to run through that a little bit. We're going to look at a few different brands. I've had a few things thrown in. I've even got something I've not even had a play with yet. That's kind of exciting from my point of view. Because it's, yeah, I've had a look, but it'd be nice to, what's it like? So different chisels. Um, as I said, they have different names. So we've got different things here. Firmer chisel, okay? I don't know if we can have a quick bounce over to camera three. Now, firmer chisel is really traditional. Let's see if we can get Matt just to go to three for me. That's two, three. Okay, good. So rectangular section. This is more, and it's actually, it's gone out of popularity. You can pick these up quite cheap secondhand. Firmer chisel is probably more a blacksmith type made thing. You've got to remember, traditionally, this would have been made by the blacksmith, the local village. They would have beaten the chisel out, hardened it, heat tempered it, done all those things. So quite basic tool, rectangular section, tapers from front to back. They fit the handle, okay? So quite a basic type of tool. All right, next one, go back to our list. Look, we're going to do beveled edge, okay? So different things. I've got a really big one here, try and show you different sizes. Now... That's really got tapered edge. Again, we'll go through a bit later. We're going to look at things. So I'm going to bounce a few other names off you, and we will try and have a look. So powering chisel, much longer, okay? Mortis chisel, let's bring this one over. All right, mortis chisel is thicker. Actually, a bit like the firmer chisel in reality, but a lot more bulky. That's for cutting those mortises out, one of, okay? So we're bouncing through a few of those jobs already. Now... We've said about different types of chisels for different jobs. So mortise chisel, cutting the mortars. You're using it a bit, I don't say like a crowbar, but that kind of technique. You're hitting it, you're beating it quite hard, so it needs to be quite robust. So I've said about different uses, but you've also got to think about different uses of maybe where you're taking the chisel. And that sounds a weird thing. Now, I'll, let's turn that around from my background. When I worked for the furniture maker and kitchen fitter, so we made the spoke kitchens. I used to have three sets of chisels. That seems ex a bit extravagant, really, doesn't it? And I can almost pick them out and what I've got in front of me. I used to have a nice set of chisels at home in case I wanted to do some nice woodwork. My really good chisels, so my expensive chisels, I kept at home and used those for those. You know. I then had a nice set of workshop chisels right, that hold their edge. They'd be wooden handled. I'd look after them. They wouldn't have been cheap. I'd make sure they were nice and sharp. We used to have wooden floor. Temperature control, building, all those things were a thing. And then I had something to go out and site with. Something that's probably plastic handled. And I know it's plastic handled. It's a split proof handle in those days. If I dropped it on the concrete floor, it didn't matter. If I hit a nail or a screw or even had to chip the plaster out the wall a little bit, it got used. And then back to the workshop, we rejuvenated it. So actually, different chisels there, even just with, and that's a range of beveled edge chisels just different handles, okay? So those things play a real part on, if you like, that environment of where you are going to take them. So if you're looking at buying yourself something as a chisel, I've already said about, think about the task, mortise pairing. We're going to go through a little bit and try and explain it, okay? Let's look at, you know, things that come into that that are quite important. First thing, really, you've got to pick it up, put it in your hand, how does it feel, okay? That's quite an important aspect of, if it doesn't feel balanced and natural in your hand, even if you part it with your cash, you're not going to pick it up and use it. So simple things like handle, 
Um, let's have a look on Frega, Matt. Let's just bounce you around a bit. This is wooden handles. So this is one of our rider chisels that we do. Now, the guys who've been following me in here a little bit know I've used these quite a bit in here. Wooden handles. Um, I do go through the customer reviews and comments. Hasn't have a finish on the handle. It does. We have a light oiled finish on here. One of the things we had discussion with, we didn't want a shiny, plasticky looking handle. I wanted something that I could feel and grip the wood, if you like. Feels more natural that you're going to hold it. Likewise, it's quite amazing that actually the Veritas and the PMV chisel they do doesn't seem to have much of a polish on that handle either. They're both quite sort of, sorry, I'm moving the wrong way, quite dull, not shiny, okay? And it's really the thing, you can feel if you like the wood. It's not slippery, you can put more oil on, you can protect it. Other nice things to handle, rounded end. When I push this, I actually, if I'm pushing it for a joint, I would actually try and push in. I'm just going to move you back a little bit on the camera. There you go. So I can grip here and push it. I can grip over the top. It's still sat in the palm of my hand. I've got all that power coming down my arm. That, that doesn't feel good there. That's going to play a part in it. Does the chisel have maybe a strike plate area? So something with hoop on the end, metal. Will that affect how you're going to hold it? Does it feel, feel smooth on the end? How much weight or how big is that chisel? Let's just compare that as a thing. Is it more bulky and heavier? That's all little things that you need to pick up and have a feel. And the other thing from our point of view, I suppose, logically, is all different. Different size hands, different strength, different sizes, all will play a part in that little bit. First thing I'd want to do, I feel it. How to go work. And then try and maybe match that up a little bit to that environment. We've said about if you're going to do something on site and I want to drop it, it's not desirable, but or chip something out the wall, or maybe it's going to get damp. Some of you guys were working out on site, site carpenter type stuff. It's not a heated building, it's hot, cold, temperature changing. Something is a plastic counter, you're not going to get any problems with it swelling up or moving. So all those things play a major part. So I'm just really bouncing through simple things with the schedule, okay? So we've looked at size, material, as in handle, okay? We're going to break this down a little bit more in a second, okay? And then we're going to look at materials for the bags. So I'm just going to be able to we're going to go back to our range of schedule. We said firmer, beveled edge. Let's have a good look at the beveled edge one, okay? Now, beveled edge chisels really came in years ago. Definitely when I started, probably the hindsight of that bit. So that actually would allow you to have a beveled edge, get right into the corner. Let's just get Matt to take a bit of paper off. He sat there kind of looking at me. I got to the end of the first sheet. I've got a sheet written up in front of me of all descriptions of what I want to run through with you. If not, it's going to be all over the place. Okay, so we've got our beveled edge bit. All right, tapers down. Other thing you need to look at with something like a beveled edge shiddle, and I'm just going to put my glasses on so I bring this up for you. How does that beveled edge work? And it's difficult to show you. The low idea with the label on here, and I'm going to bring you in with the camera, see if I can get you down there a bit more. How narrow is this edge can be an important part. If you want to get right into a nice tight corner, a beveled edge chisel is going to do it a lot better than a firmer type chisel. It's too square. The box section doesn't help you, especially on something like a dovetail type shape. And I've gone to the extreme of a, a slightly wider chisel. But this narrow edge down through here is really nice. So this is about two mil constant all the way down. The chisel also varies from thickness from front to back. So fingertip on left hand when pinching here is thinner, gets thicker coming down towards the handle. That's about adding strength. So that's nice beveled edge chisel. I'm going to do something wrong now. Let's just go. I'm going to give you a custom one, which is a German manufacturer. Much thicker down through here, down through this length. That can cause issues if you're going to use something like a honing guide where it grips it, can cause problems. It also means the further you sharpen down the blade, the thicker this edge becomes, more it's acting a bit like we just said our firmer chisel, going to push you over more because it's thicker. So look at the size of that beveled edge and how it is, okay? That's quite an important part. So beveled edge chisel is just done. Now they come in different sizes. Do a small one in a minute. Pairing chisel, much longer. Give you a scope of this. Wow. Okay. Going to bring you back a bit. So if we go to our beveled edge chisel as standard, very different. Almost twice the difference in blade length. 
Now it's designed for pairing. That's taking light cuts, removing stuff, maybe a long way in from the edge. You're cutting out here, but you've got access right back on the board. So that's an important part. This can be sharpened, and we haven't said anything about sharpening it, to a lower bevel angle. But it's definitely not designed to be struck with anything on the handle. This is physically a push. So that comfortable handle is really important. How are you going to push that in, keep it moving? You want to grip it. So that handle shape is so important for this. All right. But long beveled edge all the way down through. Nice flat back, hopefully. We're going to cover a few of these things in a minute. You understand the terminology in a sec. So, so mortar shuttle. Something thicker. As we've already said, more rectangular in section compared to our beveled edge shuttle we looked at, a lot stronger. Some of these can be taper ground from top to bottom. So actually the base is wider. The top might be a little bit narrower. That's about reducing friction and grab. Sharpened, we can keep our angles. This actually I've taken up to 35 degrees. You can get thicker. Also tapers down the length towards the handle. Other things you've got to look at when you're obviously going to sharpen, how much things flare out at the end. This has got a bit of a step, but I've got to admit, once I'm halfway down this tool, if I'm doing deep mortise, you've lost a lot of the use of it anyway. So that's not going to interfere too much. You've also got that scope of, I can sharpen pretty much on that little bit. Do I need to worry about this coming back to here? So as long as it's out of the way and it's nice and straight here, no issue with that. All right, now we're getting into a few more specialised things. I'm going to get asked, canal gouges. This is an out canal, so it's sharpened outside. In canal would be sharpened on the inside face. Again, can be good for bulk stock removal. And people don't think of that. They think I'll use a normal shuttle. But actually, I can still use this, and it will take uh, more like a scrub plane type cut. So it's quick as stock removal. I can strike it, it's got a curved end, I can push it. Ideal, it'd be nice to have something, a strike plate on the end maybe, but depends what you're going to push it with. But if you get it nice and sharp, it will go in. You could use it as a standard carving tool. So there's that kind of scope. I'm going to go smaller now, but chisel. We said about pairing chisel, one to the other. Wow. One's a lot smaller, one's bigger. So but chisel, a lot shorter than that pairing chisel we looked at. And again, that's for getting you into confined areas, smaller areas where you want to get in closer to the workpiece as well, and you're trying to cut nice and small. Again, we've got things on the handle, flat, so it gets back out of the way, but you're limited by how far you can get in. But it's about getting it in closer and more control. So the further back I am with something, more, you know, you've got that wiggle of this handle a lot more. This is about giving you a nice, small control. Cleaning up the end of dovetails and things would be fantastic. Tenons that are coming through, you put a wedge in, can be really nice. All right. Again, treated almost like a bevelled edge shuttle. Same, we've got that same edge, just really a lot shorter. Skew chisels. And no, uh, we're not going turning, okay? So the idea of these, really to get you into a corner, let's get us something as a good sort of... So if I've got a corner plate and I want to get into here, this allows me to get in, but also bring the hand around so I can cut right into that edge. It can be good for dovetails, but these are quite big. But you've got that scope of getting into that corner, clean it up. So they can be nice. Normally sold as a pair, left and right hand, so you can do both sides. All right. Again, they're basically a beveled edge shuttle, but with an angle. <coughs> two to go on our little list corner chisel now we do a couple of corner chisels we do something that's a bit more like a mortar chisel but we're corner we also do this i actually really like this normally if i'm going to do a corner chisel it will be to clean up the corner of where i put hinge all right might route it in i might want this but this has got a if you like hammer plate spring loaded so that will come down in this is our chisel bit here Trying to turn it around a bit so you can see it on the camera. Hopefully, bring my arm down. Match change camera. Look, let's push that up. So it's spring loaded. I can probably get it out. I can undo the cap on the top, take it out. There's a stop point I can see on here. So I can resharpen this. Nice thing with it being like it is, I can just tap it when I want to line it up. I can line up the edges. Gives me a nice crisp square corner. A bit easier than me doing it physically and lining up two lines with a chisel. 
Lance chisel. Really got on here. Something which is classed as an all steel chisel. All right. Now I've got different ones of this sort of thing at home. Um, again, really good. Framers type chisel for if you're house building stuff. One piece of metal all the way down through. Gives you something, yes, you can hit. All right, so that's quite an important part. This has got flat. I've got some that are beveled edges. So this is more like a firmer chisel. Has lots of different uses. Um, I use them, especially when I'm doing things like garden projects. But even fitted hinges with them. That sounds weird. All right, so that steel chisel is quite an important part. Now, just made a couple of comments there that you could strike it. A couple of the chisels on the bench we have got strike things. We said about mortar chisel. Has that metal loop on the back end. We're going to drive it with something. So we've got one. Japanese chisels actually have a hoop on the end. We're going to look at these in a minute. So they're there. I've got what I would class as sight type chisel, which is plastic with strike point. So again, three or four of these will have something you can hit it or a position you can hit it. Now you can use certain things. All right. Do that one a minute. These are called mallets, okay? These are designed to strike your chisel with. In my view, this is a hammer. Unless you're using the old steel one. No. Okay? The hammer's only used for things when they're broken. Like IT issues the other week. So, the hammer's not good for that, right? So, our mallets will work a lot better. For striking something now we can go rubber one can be good give you a bit of weight japanese hammer tend to be smaller a bit more square enough might if you want to have a look on free it'll give you a bit of an idea so smaller type japanese hammer quite small and actually they hold it further up so they're not gripping right at the back and japanese chisel and it's loop and that's fact they even cause the flaring on the top using a hammer they curl this end over i can get myself in position so they actually knock that over to mushroom that in but this is what they're striking with so quite small in comparison to a normal hammer all right so we've moved from there that's good okay right so you've said about striking handles handles can be different materials plastic like i said more better if you're somewhere where you're gonna get that humidity change it might get damp some of you might like soft grip rubber grips so this has got something a bit spongy, grip on, strike plate on the top, you've got something you can hit with, yeah, okay, so let's just pitch it, so you've got a strike, rubber grip in the side, nice, comfortable to hold, especially if you're outside and it's damp, wooden handles, if they're outside, you're going to get wet, that will cause them to swell up, that can cause issues of them even cracking, so a grip can be good, or just a straight plastic handle, all right, so this is a poly polypropylene handle, Again, it's got something you can strike on the end with your mallet. You've got to hold it and hang them up. Now, get to those three in a minute. It'll be interesting to look at. One, two, three. Okay. Blades. Materials. Okay. We've kind of said about the handles. Going to go back for the chisel. We're going to look at the blade aspect. Now, when I went to college, everything that I had and I could really buy at that point was one material. High carbon steel. Oh, it's still there. But over the last, oh, my God, how long ago was it? 30 years. Just over 30 years now. 33 years ago, I started college. Wow. So, that time, things have changed. Things have developed. Manufacturing techniques have developed immensely. So, basic chisel from high-carbon steel, which is this, relatively soft. You'll get a bright spark if you put it on a bench grinder. You will burn the chip off it if you put it on a bench grinder too quick. It will go blue very quickly. And I'm in a bright yellow spark, okay? So that will show up as high-carbon steel. Needs control if you put it on a bench grinder. A Tormek or slow-speed grinder or CBM wheel will work. Go careful on a CBM wheel. It will clog the wheel and not do it too much good, okay? So... Well, we kind of moved on. So what is there nowadays? There's still that high carbon steel. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to grab, I'm going to get myself in trouble now. One, two, three. Okay. Let's bring you back just a tiny bit. I might even bring them across my clip. These three shuttles. So we have round handle, yellow black, 
wooden one, actually from the same manufacturer. These are by a company called Narex, who are a Czech Republic manufacturer. Okay. They take chrome magnesium, which is an alloy, which basically is the same as high carbon steel, but then with a few more additives. Okay. Now, the guys that watch me regularly know in here, I've made loads of stuff with these, and I actually love sharpening these. They sharpen really nice. They hold their edge, so they work really well. Those three chisels got exactly the same blade. So what varies on these, really, that handle. So you've got something more on site. Take that nail out of the wall. Open the tin and paint and stir it, if you like. I know people that do that, okay? Not me. All right? You've got something that you want soft rip. That can be nice. Even for your home DIY and their little workshop, it can be great. You want wooden handles, you get up to this, okay? But those blades are actually the same. They sharpen really well, and they actually harden that to a, a Rockwell of 59. Now, the higher we go on that, that, that number, the harder that steel becomes. And it's a real tricky thing to try and debate and get over to you on what that really does. So if you actually harden that steel, it will hold its edge better. All right, so it becomes more resistant. It will hold that wear a little bit more. It will stay sharper longer. What does that mean to you? You will sharpen it less. All right, that's a simple thing. So those three, we've all got the same thing, that chrome magnesium, all right? Then as, like I said, an alloy, high carbon steel. Rockwell 59, and like I said, for the guys that have really, uh, you've followed me in here, we, we've got these, we can get them to a nice sharp edge. I'm going to show you how we can flatten them back. Going to do the brown one in here, haven't looked at. Get other comments from guys where we've done the brown one will be a good one because it's not being used straight out of the packet. It's not flat. I don't know if you can see the lines in the back. I don't know if we bounce between the, probably, no, sorry, mate, I'm a bit high up there. That's probably better. I think you can probably see the lines front to back. There is grinding lines that are coming across. They're not mega deep. I don't know how back flat that the back of this chisel is. I will say... I can get frustrated with chisels. I've got a couple that have had it out and I kind of go, they're not very flat. All right. This is one where I've had to spend a lot of time because they polish the edges, buff them. So if I can get it nice and flat, will be good. But I like doing that process. I like controlling what I've got to do. You also need to answer that question of where am I using this? Does it need to be that flat? Do I really need to get it back to that total flat that I might want as, say, a furniture chisel? So that's something to look at. So we'll have a look at this one we're going to go through. We're going to do that. So those basic three chisels, right? Like a, a newer type of material that's taken on from what was in my firmer chisel. And I'm almost going to give you a bit of a history lesson as well, because the next thing I came across when I started chisel going from a firmer thing, high carbon steel, was Japanese chisels. I love Japanese chisels. First of all, they are shorter. They are still a beveled edge chisel. Compare this to ooh, nearly right our two different heights, different lengths. I'll drop them on the board. We can probably get a quick shot on there. We can do I'll line them up. Okay, so you kind of get the idea. The Japanese chisel, a little bit shorter. Um, why? I don't know. Partly Japanese chisels they actually work working towards themselves a little bit. So there is that aspect. It's also got more control. They are still a beveled edge chisel. Few unique features, hollow ground on the back. So this has got a hollow on here, just coming up to camera frail, there you go. So this is hollow across here. Shorter blade length, that's more control. Beveled edge side that's come down. Now Japanese chisels are traditionally handmade, which I still can't grasp in this day and age where you've gone from a CNC factory making a beveled edge chisel in the Czech Republic something in Japan where they're handmade. Now, these also have a laminated blade, and it's very difficult to show you. So in reality, what do they have? The understructure where we've got the cutting edge is a harder steel. Sorry, let me bring back in. All right, I'll move my arm back. Trying to watch the screen. So I've got a harder material on the bottom, a softer material on the top. So they have a high-carbon alloy blade and a softer wrought iron steel on the top. Why is that? Why do they do that? The harder steel is going to hold that cutting edge. The softer wrought iron will actually allow you to sharpen it quicker. Also allows it to have a little bit of flex. Do what? Flex. What, what do you want it to flex? 
it allows it to move. If it doesn't, that harder material that's on the top is more, if you like, brittle and harder, going to crack, break. So it's giving you the best of both worlds, okay? Weird things that people comment about these, and I've had issues with over the years, you'll love this, is most Western chisels are two components, a blade and a handle. A Japanese chisel is made of four things. This one I, I've taken apart over the years, okay? It's useful as a training tool. So you have your blade, has your chain built into that fits up inside the handle, square hole. Ferrules up here, if you like, it has flat section. The blade also looks like it kinks, and it's difficult to show. I don't know if on camera too. Let's just drop down to here. That was totally flat right up to here. But if you look down it, you'd think it's 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 been bent. So they deliberately bend the handle back away from the blade a bit to give you access so you can use it the whole length of that blade. That's quite clever. You then have a separate ferrule. Now, most ferrules on a Western chisel are straight, parallel. On a Japanese chisel, they taper. More like a socket. So actually, the more pressure you push into the handle and you use it and push against it, the more you're pushing onto that taper. So the tighter the fit becomes. That's quite important. Then you have a handle. This is probably red oak. Quite hard-wearing material. Then you have a metal hoop. And these are fitted. They have a chamfer one side, which goes down. Again, if you feel this, I love this hoop. I could always wear this as a ring. I mean, it's got nice hammered effect all the way around this. So again, handmade. So I need to put it all back together now. Now, the problem actually... I'm weak. I've had over the years. So people come up and go, it's broken. It's got a crack in it. No, it's got a separate furrow. But if you start turning it around, it misaligns in places. Bit on the end. Tap it back on. I won't get a part now. My, my ring comes off the end. I know that's loose. But that's actually now secured. Can't pull that apart. So the more actually I use this well, a hammer, the tighter it becomes on here. That socket compresses, the tang goes up inside the handle. You've got that double action that works really nicely, okay? So, quite unique in construction. Very cleverly for L. Now, the Japanese shuttle we've got here, I've got two different types. They are heat treated and manufactured very slightly differently. Now, we've said so far, we've got a chisel at 59 Rockwell. I've written these on here. So I've got one that is 65 to 68, which is here. The other one is 62. Okay. So they vary a little bit. Now, when they're supplied, they are supplied with a standard 25 degree bevel. We're going to do a little bit of sharpening later. We're going to have a play with the, the brown handle. Now, do you think this has a harder rock well? The minute you want to play with something like oak or something harder, a Western material and Japanese. Most of their house construction, their furniture is softwood. So easier to work with, so you could have a lower bevel angle. The minute I want to actually try and play with something a bit harder, I need to change that front bevel, the cutting edge, up to something a little bit steeper. Now, for here, I'd probably go up to about 35. Definitely 30. But 35 will be better. By going to 35, you're making it steeper. It creates more strength behind that material because it's more brittle. All right? So it's harder, it's got that brittle nature. So it's that kind of aspect of change that bevel angle. Doesn't need to be much. So yeah, mate, you could take and go and pull that one off, all right? So we're just gonna change this. Much just take my bit of paper, got to the bottom of the page. All right, so our well, bevel angle can be cut off, changed down, you know, it's easily done, all right? So, okay. So we've got a Japanese one, gone from there. Somewhere you've lost me a bit of paper then. No? Okay. PMV. All right, so we're going to go to, sorry about it. Right. Oh, I'm up in here a minute. All right, so I'm just going to put the chisel down. So we've got a Veritas one. This is a PMV material. Now, so far we've had high carbon steel. What's PMV? It is a scintillated powder metal. Okay, what does that mean? And most people kind of 
these are as a Japanese chisel, as I said, a handmade, they're beaten, all right? So hammer, work it. This will be smelted in a forge, as we've seen, uh, you, you heat things up, you pour it, you get a bar, they can machine it. These start as a very fine grain powder. They mix it to make an alloy. It is then put into, not a furnace, but something that's under extreme high pressure and heat and pushed together. It's a very different technique. Now, the problem with this as a technique, it's expensive to do. Why do it? It controls the grain size particle of the chisel blade by having that fine powder. Now, if you think about it, if you cut through a piece of steel, no matter what it is, and you sharpen it, you're getting a grain structure inside. Pores, holes. Some bits are rough. If they're bigger or smaller, that will affect what you get as a sharp edge. That's what you're relying on the manufacturer to really do. You get it to an even state. So when you sharpen it, it's nice and equal. So it'll cut nicely. won't be too fragile. So let's say if you've got big bits of carbon in there that they haven't broken down enough or mixed it too wrong, they're going to splinter out when you start cutting. Break off. That's not good. It's going to give you a chipped out edge quite quickly. So the PMV, they've really controlled that aspect of getting it right down to something finer and then pushing it together. But I say it's more expensive to do. The cost of making that mature, not, not easy to do. These are lovely as a chisel, though. They have a beautiful taper. Front to back, so difficult to show you down on here. And if I bring it down a bit more, let's bring the camera in, okay? Yeah, there you go. Not turn over. This is almost, I won't say straight out of the pocket, but the backs of these, they guarantee, are flat. Flat all the way up to the handle. Nice taper section front to back here, so it gets thicker down towards. That's about adding strength. Caramelized maple handle, which is heat treated, so it stops it absorbing moisture. Again, nice rounded end, so if I want to push it, hand grips nicely. Not too long, not too heavy. Other thing, the taper. So we said about that on the Japanese furrow, works exactly the same way. This is about compressing fibers, so therefore, as you use it, you're adding more strength to it, unlike a Western one, where I've even got actually down on here, so it sums it up beautifully. On my pairing chisel, I can move this furrow about. So it's not actually gripping, it's not compressing those fibers, it's not really doing anything. Stainless steel ferrules, and these are stainless, won't split like a brass one. So that ferrule aspect is quite an important part of what they do. PMV chisel, as I said, beautiful, nice and thin right down on this beveled edge. In actual fact, almost sharp, okay, which is a good and a bad thing. You've got the wrist you can cut yourself on here. I can occasionally take a diamond file, just literally knock off that sharp edge. But beautiful sharp chisel, okay? But a bit, more, a bit more expensive, okay? So we're going up in price now. Now, yeah, okay. Well, it's like birthday time. Now I get to open a box now, okay? Haven't played with this. This is something new from Narex. All right, so we can have a quick look on here. I think, man, let's just see if I can line up something else. So this, first of all, get there, I'm going to bring it down, bring it down there. All right, so this is a Narex chisel. So this is the same as what we've said about the brown one. All right, so I've got that one we looked at. Now, this is really to celebrate a couple of things, I think. First of all, they wanted to make something as a new chisel. Um, they wanted to, to maybe try and compete with something like the PMV. Nerex have been going, um, and it, this is difficult. We've got some of the guys in the States watching. Yes, I know you get this out there. Um, weirdly, in the UK, Nerex have appeared in the last 10 years. Maybe a little bit before, but no, look, which is shocking because they've been going since 1919. The company is 102 years old. Wow. Now, if you've been making hand tools for 102 years and you're still going, you must be doing something right. So, got to be something there, okay? So, this is based on a couple of things. First of all, the chisel handle on this is ash, and this is based on a design from 100 years ago. This is called a Richter chisel. This is based or named after the original owner, okay, 
Balkla, Richer, all right? So he formed the company back then. What they've actually done, they've taken a new alloy, which is chromium, all right, which adds to make it harder, wear resistance, and then vanadium, all right, which gives it the strength and finer structure. So what they're trying to get to is that PMV type state, a finer molecule structure within it gives it uh, more formation strength and size within that. Right? The next thing they do is cryogenically treat it. What's that? They submerge it in liquid nitrogen. They will take it down to minus 160 degrees. Hmm. Now, that's all about changing the molecule structure and aligning those grain particles. And again, this is modern day techniques. 30 years ago, we didn't have that. We didn't have that on a chisel, all right? So this is about trying to make it more wear resistance. All right, so let's just give you a bit of comparison. I'll put that and the, the PMV together. It's a little bit bigger. Let me drop the camera back a little bit. I'm looking at the screen now. Okay, I can come to there. Maybe I'll bring it in a bit. A little bit bigger in size, lengthwise, but not a lot. Handle, bit bigger in size. Okay, just put in your palm in hand. I will tell you, like I said, I got handed this box yesterday. This is what we want you to use as part of your video. I've done a bit of research, but not actually been able to play with this. Feels quite nice. We've got stainless steel ferrule on here in between, which we haven't done with the other Narex. And there is in the rider ones, there is a leather washer in between where the blade and the ferrule is. That's a nice feature. That's about shock absorbing. Okay, so that's a good little feature. Nicely polished. Um, if you compare this to, and I don't know if you can see the difference on the lines on this. It's so difficult to get over on a camera if I bring it in. The one with my thumb is now, I can see visually more grinding lines coming round. This is actually almost like a polish back. That means hopefully they've taken out some of that work I've got to do to get rid of the lines on here. But you'll pay a bit more money for it. So you've got that choice of, do I do it yourself? Or can we, uh, can we live with it? But again, what are you going to use it for? So sensibly, I think if we go back to camera one a minute, um, this logically isn't that on-site chisel that's going to chip plaster out the walls. You might meet a nail, you might drop it. It's not that outrageously expensive, but actually with what it is, how it's been made, that'd be a shame, wouldn't it? You can, you know, uh, cheaper chisel. I, I can sum this up. The, the brown handed chisel, um, I think that's about eight, nine pound. Under 10 pound to buy the chisel. And that's got that blade that I know works. All right. We've said about that chrome manganese blade. I've used it in here for years and been really impressed. So that kind of money. These are about 40 quid, so four times the price. But I couldn't take that on site. This is the thing I left at home. All right. So nice handle, nice grip, polished back. Sharp to a 25 degree standard bevel. From there, you can add what you want. And again, other comments I get from people, and with any of the chisels, except for one I'll give you in a minute, which is the Veritas, these need a sharpen. Why don't they sharpen them for you? They don't know what you're going to use it for. Softwood, hardwood will vary. Some of you might have your own specific things you want to sharpen it at. My Japanese chisels have almost got to sharpen as one angle. Don't have a secondary bevel on some of them. So all those little things can play a part. They're not sure what you're going to want to do with it. Um, we got leaflet. We've got anti-rust paper and a plastic bag and store it back inside. I don't know if you're going to do that, but okay. Let's have a quick look. You know, have a sharpener. Let's see what it feels like. So we've gone out through basically a line of two, one, two, three or four different ranges of chisels. And how they vary of what they've used material blade wise and how that's developed over the last few years is quite amazing. Um, the PMV, I know I've had turning tools, and again, I've got a Veritas, I can sharpen it. Wow, it just goes on. It doesn't seem to lose its edge. Now, I did steepen the angle up. Uh, on my Veritas, I think I've got 33, 35 degrees as an angle, a bit steeper than I'd normally have. All the chisels I've got in the room, things in behind me, are 30 degrees. 25 is a primary bevel. So by going steeper, that's about adding more strength. 
So the chisel we've just looked at uh, is in here, okay? 62 as a Rockwell. The PMV, I think I found, was 61 to 63. So they're very similar on hardness. The hardest chisel I've got on the Rockwell scale is that Japanese chisel. It's 68. That's quite hard. That's almost getting to high-speed steel, but not quite. It makes it more brittle. So I've got to think about changing those angles, making it steeper, giving it a bit more strength. Downside, we're giving it a steeper angle. It takes more effort to push it through the work. So my pairing chisel, which is that long one, not going to strike the end. I can actually have a 20 degree cutting edge on here because I'm actually going to use it and slice through those fibers gently. The minute I start putting shock into it and hammering it, or hitting it with a mallet, that's going to cause more problems. Not designed for that, not designed for bulk removal. All right, so chisel then, a couple of things. We said to you, people who often say about, got to level the back. How big an issue is it? Okay, I'm going to turn this over. We're going to use the brown handle chisel, I think. So let's put diamond stone. All right. Underneath, I've got my scary sharpening board. Now, first thing, we want to level the back of the chisel. Okay. Whatever you level it on has got to be flat. Because if what you're using isn't flat, it's not going to be level when you finish. So those little things play a part in it. So with that kind of scenario of think about what you're going to use. Right, I'm just looking for something I can use. So I've got some home right, which is a water additive. I've got a diamond. Put the glasses on because I've got a funny feeling. Right, wrong side, 1,000. That'll be all right. We're going to flip it over 400 grit. A little bit. We want to do the chisel back. Um, and again, I know... Trying to show this on a video could be fun. Uh, pen's getting a bit worn out. Oh, I know what that is. This has got a protective layer on it. Now, this might have a spray lacquer. I know the big chisel I've got has a spray lacquer. The new chisel, ash handle. No, nah, that's where it goes in that rust bag. It's got a grease coating. So this might have a lacquer. I've got to get through it. Diamond stone, I know, is flat. If I go with water stone, I've got to make sure it is flat. Now, we're going to work up and down that stone. Fingertips are doing a really important job. So I've already started to have a look. This is quite interesting. Can you see where I've hit? There, there, there. So we've got a little bit hollow down the centre, a little bit hollow on the tip here. But already starting to dress that in. Again. Work around it. I can go up and down that stone. Now, if you're a guy and you're working on site and you're doing the plaster chip back set, clean the walls out, you might drop this. Do you need to do this? Do you really need it to be flat, flat? All right, let's have another quick look. We're getting somewhere. I've got a tiny hollow in here I can still see. I'm just going to grab some blue roll off the wall down the end. So we've got a bit of that. I'm going to wipe this over, flat it back again. Let's give a bit more black line. This doesn't actually take that much effort. I can go round and round small circles. Diamond stone could be a nice one to use for this because it's going to tell me and work quickly. Getting there. Let's go back and forwards now. Up and down. And again, fingertips are really doing a lot of work. Pushing down. I'm not holding the handle. I can grip a little bit. Finger and thumb. All right. That's looking better. I've got hollow in here. Small one. But I've already dressed quite a lot of that out. I'm going to go finer now. So we're going to go 1,000. We can do the same. So I can work out the grades quite quickly. People seem to think flattening the back of the chisel takes a long time. You can spend an hour doing a chisel. Yeah, I've been there, done that. Part of it is right type of equipment. Diamond stone is better. It's flatter. I used to do this on a Japanese water stone, which 
nice and quick cutting, but unless the stone is nice and flat, you can spend a lot of time correcting things. Now, I'm hoping you can see that a little bit comes up in the camera. There it is, a little hollow. Okay, now I'm going to change direction. I'm going to push up and down. So I'm just changing my grip, still using fingers on my right hand with maximum weight over the blade. Well, cut them down. Okay. Now, got a bit of a crossover now. That's good. We're going to use lose our diamond stone. On here, we've got my scary sharpening board. This is great for this. Now, I've got two grades on here. I've got 800, two and a half thousand. I've just turned the board round because I want to be this sided. Bring it over a bit. I think that's better. Again, fingertips, keeping them weight. A little bit of water is designed to flush the metal out. Can you see that black being pushed about? That's our metal particles. I can work down the chisel a bit, bring it up a bit squarer. So I swing my right arm out with the handle. Take a quick look, see what's going on. Already looking better. I'm going to swing around two and a half thousand now. So this doesn't actually take that long. And keep going. Not bad. I'm quite impressed with that. Okay. How about if we want to go a bit finer? I said to you about Japanese water stones. This is 8,000 grit. First thing I want to do, I've just put it in my holder on there. I'll bring you back on the camera just a little bit. I need to make sure it's flat. I need some water. Diamond stone. A uh, thousand grit, I think. Got to hope everything will stay. Oh, getting a bit of grab on there, a bit more water to flush it out. I've got a bit of residue on there. That'll do. Bit of water. Watch up. Again, two fingers again, supporting it. Let's have a quick look. We can go from both sides. A bit more access on this. So the reason for using the diamond stone, check that water stone was flat. It was gripping nicely. Just varying. Which way we work. So 8,000 grit should give us, in reality, a bit more of a polish. Which actually, for the type of chisel we've got on here, with the plastic handle, probably a little bit of a waste. Now, Matt, let's just see if we can get, get you on the camera and just try and see if we can get you in there. Right, Matt's put his arm, it's got a bit of a question, I think. I'm, I've probably been running along in my own little world over here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I've uh, got a question from Martin. Uh, what is the best angle to sharpen your everyday chisel? Just a standard chisel? Your everyday chisel. Yeah. Okay. Most of, and I've already kind of said in here, so a standard beveled edge chisel, most of them will come with a 25 degree angle as a standard bevel. Most of them I will sharpen in here to 30. All right, so bringing it up a little bit steeper. My pairing chisel can be less because of that strength. So 30 is an all, a good all-round use. The minute you get into something like the PMV, though, bring it up a bit. The Japanese chisels, I would bring up that angle just a little bit. 32, 33 would be good. Three degrees, doesn't that all? that enough? That just adds that little bit more strength to the edge, okay? So that'll do. In that fact, we're going to do it. So let's move on water stone. And I've done quite a lot of sharpening over the years. So we'll go ahead and try not to do too much sharpening today. So that chisel, 
And we said, all right, that brown handle chisel is, I think, about eight, nine pound, somewhere around there. What should we sharpen it on? Okay, we bounce off options. Let's put the scary scar board out the way. That's got a finer grit. If you were using the chisel we've just got, I'm reassembling my diamond station now. And there, glasses back on. This says planes. I want chisels. We'll turn it round. Clip style honing guide. Our chisel will hopefully fit in here. Now, the reason I've gone to the diamond sharpening setup, and I don't know if I, I didn't bring it here, Dad. I just brought it back off the edge. I'm going to show you what I've done. I'll put it back in. Ugh. On this end, it says chisels. I've got a 30 degree overhang and reset point. So this gives me repeatability setup, which is that as a length to the side of that Eclipse style honing guide. Just moved it, just double check. I'll we'll grab the bottle of water, tighten it up. Home right, we can go with that diamond stone on the thousand grit. I just want to tighten that and make sure it's not going to slip. We used a screwdriver, I promise. So, so, if you had this type of chisel, and if you think about it, the background I said, when I went out on site with Keith that I used to work with, I want to sharpen my chisels on site, tuck them up. This is fantastic for that. It's quite portable and pick it up. A little bit of water, you can find that most places. We've got reset either end, finger and thumb I can get up on here. I can put fingertips, come down. Okay, this is giving me an accurate 30 degrees and makes it repeatable. All I should have done, and I don't know if you can see it on the camera there, let me bring it up and trying to watch the screen, because you've got a little silver line across the front of that now. That's all I need. The back, I produced a bear. Now, I've got a debate. Do you mean I polish the back of it? I'm going to go to my blue, because I don't want to scratch it now. But in reality, I could have used the back of there. But it seemed a shame to scratch it, having polished it. So then I'm just going to go leather strop, put it down a few times. And then let's put a bit of honing compound on. So this is honing soap. A bit dry, this one. Leather strop again, bring it up. So I gently bring the handle, raise it. And there, bring it down through. And we should have something. Feels not too bad. I could add a bit more in a minute, okay? To sharpen chisels, it's so important. And to get them sharp and make it repeatable. Um, let's go back to the water stone. Just grab that holder. Some guys are going to go, I, I, I don't want one of those. I don't want a board. I, want, I sharpen freehand. Okay. Japanese chisel, too bad it's smaller, can be difficult to get in some of the honing guides. There are a few things I've got on the bench I could show you. The Veritas ones will hold this. When I learned to sharpen chisel, really struggled. I'm going to bring your camera back a little bit to get this and then move it up and down accurately to 30. Just lining stuff up. That's better. Okay. And I might expect you can have a look on two as well, mate. Okay. I really struggled to do that up and down. Well, you might find easier turn the chisel sideways. There's a stone. Anyway, let's have a little bit of water so we can flush the stone. I then pick this up. I can feel my bevel. I'm just bridging across the hollow. I come down it. Got to control it. Not too quick. Slow movement will work. Then do the back. The back is just as important as the front. If you define the word sharpness, it is the accurate coming together of two ground points. Now, our Japanese chisel, I think maybe we go from three. Let's have a quick look. We've got that hollow grind. I've got that polished area all the way around it. Sharpened edge up on here. We'll show you that in a sec. Really get that. I could go to leather strop. That's not bad. Right? So if you didn't want to go... Honing guide, you feel confident, get to there. Now, all I'm doing is gently ping that up. I get a little bead of water up here. 
That's when I know I'm at my right angle. But it takes a bit more control and a bit of effort. Honing guide, I said about. Let's have a look at a couple of things then. We'll do this quick. I want to do, do some cutting, really. Right. Okay, so this is Veritas Honing Guide. Um, newer one. This is, I can't remember, Narrow Tool Guide? I think it's on the list. Can't remember. Now, I've also got a setup board, which they print on paper. I put on there. I've got a lower and higher jaw setting. Let's see if this will go. Now, on the Japanese, and it's good to show you different things. On the lower one, I can't get it in far enough to get up to my 30. Let's go on the higher setting, and there's two jaw mount settings on here. And this is why I said to you, you've got to play around with trying to find what will work. Now, on this is a chisel. Japanese chisel is very short. I can't get a three-point location. So, won't work in this easily. All right. Different one. Mark two, I know this works. So I can open the jaws out, which is here. I can put my chisel through a bit more. Bring it up. Just going to flip over. I want 30, 35. What have I got as options? If I go 40, 35, I could go back to the red. Let's go on there. So I want to go about 35 because this is a harder material. 68 Rockwell, this is. I've got to bring it right up to there. Undo the front. We played with that a few times over the years with the videos. That will give me something that I can do a Japanese shiddle with a repeatable setup. All right. I've said to you about repeatability. No matter what it is, try and make things repeatable. Now, let's move that. I've got, where is it there? I'm hoping. We open the vice out a little bit. I've got a piece of pine. And you go, it's only got a piece of pine. It's not exactly difficult to cut, is it? No. To cut a piece of pine nicely and grown with a chisel, it has got to be sharp. So I'm just setting up. I don't want to take too much. There it down. And it's a good experiment try and do. See how sharp things are. Can you slice across it? I'm not hitting it with anything. I'm pushing it. Slicing those fibers. On the back edge, I'm working in towards my support board that I've got in the front. I can change direction now. I've got to come down to here. And there. That means I don't break the fiber off the end. Okay, let's just have a quick look on three, I think, Matt. I'm hoping you can see those are nice and cleanly cut. Oh, there's no tear out. Let's drop this down again. Mm, going to the brown handle chisel. I don't know if this is a sharp. Oh, I don't know. Look at that. Taking a bit more as a cut, but it'll work. So I know you've no, I say not too much of a challenge. Piece of softwood. Now, if it's not sharp, I'm trying to push that nice and firm. We haven't sharpened this, right? So this is the right, this is the new one. I ought to sharpen it. Yeah, cut. First of all, I'm having to push more. It is cutting, but actually tearing the fibres a little bit more. I'm getting a hole in round them. I don't know if I can... I know I can't tilt the camera back from there. So on here, let's just have a look. Where is he there? I've just done this a little bit. More tall grain in there than what I did behind. So straight out of the packet, no, it will need a sharpen. Going to need a little bit of work. So I need to sharpen this up a little bit on the back. But I'm quite surprised that if you take some of this. Now, a bit of oak. Ooh. Going to do the thing I hate now. A mallet. 
we can set up a cut. Now I put it on a piece of rubber mat. So we chiseled the end off our bit of oak. Let's see what we get now. Does it still cut? Is it still reliable? It's pretty good. Still working. I know, a couple of cuts. But it's worth playing around with. The steep angle, 30 degrees, will be good. It will give me a bit more strength. If I'm too thin, so 25, definitely going to kill that edge over. Round it as a bear. Japanese shittle, definitely need to be higher. 68 degrees rock rail. So actually, I brought that up to 35. You saw me cut with that. Cuts beautifully. Takes less effort. Shorter handle actually means I'm nearer the workpiece. I can control things a lot more. That's good. All right. And the thing occasion I get. So we've said about comments from customers of backs not level. I'll tell you one thing. That's amazing now. That's that. That's that brown handle. Got to shine. I've even got reflection. I can almost see mate in the camera over here. Okay. No, didn't take as long. Three mil chisel. Bit of a problem error on one of the things I know of and reading the reviews. It's not beveled edge. No, it's quite rectangular. I'm hoping you can see that if I roll it around on my hand. And I'm sorry, my hands are looking a bit black now. I've been sharpening again. So if you're doing something like a dovetail and you want to get in between here nice and easily, it's going to cause a few issues. I'm going to try and work around here off the end of the bench, put the glasses back on. I want to get down into here. I can cut it. Again, my rubber mat will help. I'm not blocking the light camera. I'm just looking up. But you bet it's square. It doesn't fit into that dovetail shape nicely. In reality, what it does do, the top corners, and again, I don't know if you'll really see this on the camera. Let's get something to point with. Little top corner, either side, is hitting further up on the dovetail, limiting how that chisel will go in. Hence the fact, I can pick it up like I have. It's wedged in now, even though I've taken the cut. So why doesn't this taper on the side if it's classed as a beveled edge chisel? Can't make them small enough to do with the bevel. Not like we do a normal. But you guys can. You know what? So this is my small dovetail chisel from when I went to college. I've ground the sides on the first inch to a taper towards the top. Yes, it means you've got to do a little bit of work. But actually, that gives me a nice tapered edge to give me clearance if I'm going to do something like some small dovetails. I can still hold it in a sharpening jig. And small chisels are a pain to sharpen it on anything. Freehand, even worse. They dig into my water stone. But by tapering the edge to the top, got that, I've got something rectangular to grip further back to it holds it. I've got more structural strength down the chisel because I've only got that short section to work with. Um, if you're doing dovetails and you're sharpening this and you're cleaning up, that's going to last you a lifetime, that little bit. So it doesn't take a lot of effort just to taper the edge on either side up towards the top. All right, so I think you can probably see what I've done there. Quite easy to do, okay? And that's maintaining the strength of the chisel and everything else, giving you something you can hold to handle, do the sharpening, everything else. Okay. Hopefully. Bit of an insight, different chisels. Not the most interesting section, maybe. I don't know, different materials. I'm going to have a play with this and really see what this new chisel does. Quite impressed with this. I love the look of how this is. Flat, nice handle, nice weight. All those things are a benefit. But will it cut right? Quite shocked on how quick I can level a chisel for you. Get people complain, oh, it takes forever. No, it doesn't. Quite easy to do. Why don't the manufacturer do it? If I'm going to a building site and I'm going to use this when I fit the kitchen and I'm chipping out the plaster wall, it's a bit pointless, isn't it? I can sharpen it. It will still do the job with that bolt removal. Or you want to use it as a nice chisel, great. Plastic handles, more suitable for those sort of environments where maybe you're going to get damp or you want something as a soft grip. Strike plates could be a benefit, but remember, a hammer's a no-no. You'll ruin the handles, okay? So hopefully, give me a bit of an insight, all right? If you want to see more sharpening on those sort of things, let me know. Want any advice on your chisels and what you've got, email me. I'll get back to you, I promise, all right? So if you enjoyed, give us a thumbs up. Share it with someone else. They might need this info. Might be useful, okay? We'll see you next week. I can't remember what we got on Tuesday, but Carl will be back in on Tuesday with you, all right? So thank you all, and we'll see you then. Bye then.